So, revolutionary greetings, comrades. You are all welcome to this course. My name is Comrade Pijin Adimengu. I'm speaking to you directly from a colonial territory called Kenya. <clears throat> this is our Consciousness Study Group class, which is a Saturday class where we always discuss the unity of Africa into one continental government. So, feel most welcome. To those who will be listening to this recording, we appreciate your attention and your time. To those who have attended physically, we do also appreciate your presence and your time. I will be doing this presentation in the next 45 minutes, if possible. Maximum should be one hour. And we'll have the analysis to go through this as we give our response and maybe discuss what should be done or what must be done as a, as a response to this report. Before I start off, I'll say that this is a report that was done by WAW on want. If you check up a bit, which is a which is a global it's called War on Want, which is a fighting global of poverty. This report was published in July 2016. It was written by and researched by Mark Cute Curtis. So they are the owners and the authors of this report. And what we do, I particularly heard about it when, of course, I heard uh, Julius Malema speak of, of it when he was in Kenya here in a conference that I attended in, in Lukenya University. And he happened to talk about 101 and unlisted companies that are actually looting resources for Africa. And this is what informed my interest to check on this report. I found it on audit. The report is available on their website, which is www.warnwant.org. So let me go straight to the report. The title of this report is written, The New Colonialism, The British Scramble for African Energy and Mineral Resources. So let me start straight from the preface. The continent of Africa is today facing your colonial invasion, no less devastating in scale and impact than what that which is suffered during the 19th century. As before, the new colonialism is driven by a determination to plunder the natural resources of Africa, especially its strategic energy and mineral resources. At the forefront of this scramble for Africa, a British company actively aided by, aided and abetted by the UK government. So this report of course revealed the degree of which the British company are now controlling Africa key mineral resources. That includes of course gold, which will include platinum, diamond, copper, oil, gas, and it also includes coal. Now this report was actually done in 37 countries under the sub-Saharan countries. And these sub-Saharan countries, actually the London companies control almost worth $1 trillion of Africa's most valuable resources. The UK government has used its power and influence to ensure the British mining companies have access to African raw material. This was the case during the colonial period and it's still the case up to date. So this is actually the, the preface by Dr. Hilary John, which is the executive director of uh, war on want. Now to start us off, I'll be of course discussing three key, four key areas, which will be the controlling of African resources, who are the major companies, which are their key countries, their tax events and London Stock Exchange. Then we'll be checking at the British foreign policy, which is actually aiding them to do this. Then we'll be taking case studies actually of Rio, Rio Tinto in Madagascar. We'll also be checking British companies in occupied Western Sahara and Glencoe and Vandanta in Zambia. And last, we'll be also be checking on cases of killings of our people, relocations of our people, labor right abuse of our people, and tax dodging. Now, as I've said that this report was actually combined or compiled by War on Want, and when they did this, actually their report revealed that there are 101 listed companies on the London Stock Exchange that have mineral operation in sub-Sahara Africa. They include, of course, 37 countries. And mainly these companies are British companies with the 59 of them, of course, incorporated in UK. And others are incorporated in British tax events. That's Gansey and Jesse. You must realize that Jesse and Gansey are described here a tax event for British. Many of the remaining companies are actually based in London despite of their country of incorporations. Now, out of the 101 companies, that now control an Africa resources. It has been identified that they control 
close to 1.05 trillion worth of resources in Africa. That's by 2016. And this, of course, as I've said, include oil, gold, diamond, coal, and platinum. And most of the resources they control, as you can see here, include uh, the 6.6 .6 billion barrel of oil, which is currently worth close to $276 billion. They control 79.5 million ounces of gold, which is worth $119 billion. They also control 699.3 million carats of diamond, which is worth $134 billion. They also control 287 million ounces of platinum, which is worth $305 billion. As I've said, of course, these companies control the 36 companies control an area totaling to 371,132 kilometers squares. This is a total combination of their mining sections in Africa, 371,132 kilometers square. That's more than a country and many countries in Africa. Now, who are these major companies? Of course, if you go to the oil sector, the companies here listed are 27 of them, 27 which actually operate in 27 sub-Saharan sub countries. They include long-standing oil production countries such as in Nigeria, in Angola, but also there are other companies in Kenya and Ghana. The major companies include Anglo-Irish Company, which is Talo Oil, which control 307 million barrels of oil in 12 countries in sub-Sahara, as described itself as Africa leading independent oil company and Shell, whose license controls 691 million barrels, mainly in Nigeria. Also important is Clanco, a company incorporated in Jersey and best known as giant commodity traders. But they actually control 175 million barrels of oil in Cameroon, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, uh, and Equatorial Guinea. But some lesser company, non company, of course, have control in other parts of the country, for example, Madagascar Oil, a company incorporated in Bermuda, but whose corporation of corporate office is in London and has interest in five oil blocks in West Madagascar, including the Simiroro block, which contains a massive of 1.7 billion barrels of oil. Chariot Oil and Gas Company, which is registered also in Ganse, hold interest in oil block in offshore Mauritania and Namibia worth 900 million barrels of oil. Another company also is called General Energy, a company registered in Jersey, which control, which states that it is targeting 2 billion barrels of oil in Somaliland. If you go to the gold field, as you can check, we have 30 listed companies in London Stock Exchange that are operating in 21 sub-Saharan African countries. The big players are, of course, Akashia Mining PLC and Rang Rand Gold Resource. Acacia is a British company which is part of the Canadian group, which is Barrick Gold Corporation, controls almost 12.5 million ounces of gold and is the leading gold producer in Tanzania, where it operates three mines. Acacia holds license covering 6,000 kilometers square of land around its gold mining projects, of course, in Tanzania, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Rangland, a company which is incorporated in Jersey owns and operates five gold mines in Africa and does exploration projects in Senegal, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Its gold mine contains 24.6 million ounces of gold, worth $36.9 billion. Smaller gold companies, of course, also include a British firm, which is Avofset Mining, which controls around 7 million ounces of gold in Burkina Faso and Guinea. Amara Mining, which says it has the largest resource base of any London listed junior companies, gold company, which is over 9 million ounces of resources, mainly in Cote d'Ivoire and Sierra Leone. There's also Pan African Resources, which mines in South Africa and contain million ounces of gold. If you go in Diamond, we have African Diamond that are held by two London listed companies, which include Anglo American and Petra Diamonds. The British giant Anglo American via its subsidiary, DBS, controls 360 million carats of diamond through its African corporation. It also produces around a third of the world rough diamond by value. DBS is well known as the world leading diamond company with mines in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, and Namibia. Petro Diamonds Incorporated in Bermuda also controls 309 million carats of oil, 
from four producing mines in South Africa and one in Tanzania. That better be said, Tanzania only important diamond producer. Eight smaller listed diamond companies also operate in Africa. They include British company as Firestone Diamonds, PLC, which owns 75% of the Long Hobon Diamond Mine in Botswana, where full production was expected by May 2016. This mine alone has a total resource of 23 million carats, worth $4.4 billion. In South Africa, Diamond Hop PLC operates the less diamond mine south of Johannesburg, which of course contains 13.4 million carats of oil. Another British company, Stella Diamonds, PLC, is developing diamond mines in Guinea and Sierra Leone, obtaining 7.8 million carats. Then you have in the coal sector, we have also two companies. In, we have a company in the coal sector, which is Anglo-American. It controls around 659 million tons of saleable coal in South Africa. It only owns and operates seven thermal coal mines and a whole major shareholding in another. Glencore also owns 43 to 100% of nine coal co operations in South Africa, which consists, of course, 25 mines containing 901 million tons of thermal coal. Other significant coal producers are Sabol Mining, which contains, which mainly produces coal in two projects in Zimbabwe containing a massive 1.8 billion tons of coal, and Bushved Minerals, which is exporting for coal in Madagascar in a project containing of course, 136 million tons, one of the three thermal coal resources in the country. If you go along also, we have other companies which collectively control 3.6 billion tons of coal in Africa. And this makes companies significant polluters and contributors of climate change. As now we are discussing about climate issues and Africa is being subjected to climate issues. These companies are actually biggest contributors of climate change in Africa. But like in Kenya here, of course, the president wants to make us to pay tax, which is green tax, when we don't actually meet them but, or co pollute them. But in 2014, the UK consumed 48.5 million tons of coal, yet London listed company in Africa controls 74 times as much. If you go to platinum, African platinum wealth is concentrated overwhelmingly in South Africa, where it is largely controlled by Anglo-American and Lone Min PLC. Anglo-American controls 200 million ounces of platinum, from for from over a dozen mines in South Africa. Indeed, it provides 40% of the world newly mined platinum, making it Africa and the world largest producer of platinum group metals. Lomnim, notorious for the Marikana massacre in 2012, controls 42.9 million ounces of platinum from its mine in South Africa, principally from its Marikana mine, which contains 35 million ounces of platinum Another significant British company called Jubilee Platinum, which has a majority stake in the JATE project in South Africa, containing the world's largest underdeveloped defined block of platinum ore. JATE contains a potential of 65 million ounces of platinum, group elements, and gold. Of course, other minerals listed and key players are as follows. For example, British company dominate African copper industry notable in Zambia. Sierra, Sierra Rutile Limited owns the world only large high-grade producing primary rutile mine covering 876 kilometers square of Sierra Leone together with exploration licenses. Rio Tinto Mineral Sands Ilmentine Projects in South Madagascar contains nearly 70 million tons of ilmenite, accounting for around 10% of the world market for minerals. British company Gemfield PLC owns the Montepuez ruby deposit in Mozambique, believed to be the largest known ruby concession in the world. It also owns the Kagem emerald mine in Zambia, the single largest emerald mine in the world, which in 2013 produced 30 million carats of emerald and barrel, roughly 20% of the global production. Jamfield also owns 50% of Kariba Emertrans mine in Zambia, one of the world's largest producing amethyst mine. Now, if you go to key countries, for example, South Africa, we find that in South Africa, there are 26 listed companies extracting resources in South Africa. And if you check them, they include, of course, in manganese, we have Anglo-American 
Protex, Rare Earth, we have Galileo Resources, Zinc, we have Vendata PLC, Nickel, we have Lomnin, Sylvia Platinum Limited, Vanadium, we have Bushville Mineral Stovet, Mineral Sand, we have Rio Tinto, and Chrome, we have Glencore Sylvia. If you go in Tanzania, which is another country, you'll find that we have also company listed there, including Petra Diamonds and Acacia Mining. Of course, as we've said, the latter four companies have exploration classes covering 8,571 kilometers square of the country resources. Other companies, of course, include BG Group, which now is part of Shell. We have also OPIA or OP Energy PLC. We have Shell, we have Solo Oil PLC, we have Wendworth Resources Limited, and other companies include Uranium Resources PLC, which is exploring uranium in three projects in the southwest of the country, covering 10,000 kilometers square. In Diamonds, as you've seen, Botswana and Lesotho, we have those companies, including Anglo-American, DBS. We have Game Diamonds. In Lesotho, we have Game Diamonds also operating in the country. And you see, the mine contains, where the control, of course, contains carats worth 5 million carats, worth 10.5 billion. Now, if you go down a bit, you realize we have also companies in Zambia, for example, which we have uh, copper, which is the key resources in Zambia. And there are companies like Fast Quantum based in Canada, which own almost 80% of the Kansashi mine, the largest copper mine in Africa, which is a British company. You have the Vendata Resources, which own majority of stake in, in, a, in a part called Concola mines, copper mines. We have also Glencore Company. In Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire, we have seven British companies that are currently operating in Burkina Faso. We have Nording, Nivi Company, we have Amara Company. And if you go along in Ghana, we have, of course, also Talo, which has four offshore oil operations, while two are listed companies. We have Clone Tough Energy PLC, we have Petrel Resources PLC, which own majority of stakes there. In Kenya, five listed companies also have the right and they check oil and gas both as, for example, you have Talo Oil, which has almost 50 to 60% interest in and operates five offshore oil blocks in West and North West Kenya, which are being developed as the company's key exploration activity. These blocks contain six, 600 million barrels, 600 million barrels of oil. And if you go along, you find that it covers almost 52,000 kilometers square. Go to Mauritius, Mauritania, we have five offshore companies. Go to Namibia, seven companies. Go to Somalia, two companies, which include General Energy and another company called Sterling Company. Now, those are the key companies that are actually controlling some of our resources, but check on their tax evasion. You realize these companies, it says that of the 101 listed companies featured in this report, one quarter are incorporated in tax haven. For example, British Virgin Island has seven companies which are incorporated there. Jesse Ogansé has six companies. Jesse has six companies. Bermuda has four companies. And Cayman Island has two companies. This raises clear alarm bells concerning tax avoidance. The incorporation of companies in tax haven increases the likelihood of cooperation funneling or funneling wealth out of Africa. It is estimated that Africa loses between $35 billion yearly in illicit financial flow and further $46 billion a year in multinational company profits taken from operations in Africa. If you go along, you realize that there are, the list of 25 companies in tax haven includes seven major producers of African main natural resources in 29 countries. Then you also realize that these companies, of course, have a, capitaliz a capitalization of $41.5 billion, according to London listed figures. The size and extent of this operation highlight the likelihood that Africa is losing large potential revenue from the activities of these companies. The case study on Glencore and Vendata in Zambia that is presented in this report, for example, highlights that. Of 101 listed companies, as you say, a quarter of them almost control their resources out. Many of these tax haven incorporated companies are really based in London. For example, Gem Diamonds Limited, incorporated in British Virgin Island, 
leased its head office in London. Sable Mining, also incorporated in British Virgin, leased its head office same in London if you check in their website. Madagascar Oil, which is incorporated in Bermuda, still has office in London. UMC London Corporation, Energy Corporation, which is actually incorporated in Cayman Island, also gives its address to Monarch and London. Petra Diamonds, which is actually also incorporated in Bermuda, still has its main office in London. So the London Stock Exchange play a critical role in facilitating control over Africa resources by these 101 companies. In all, the listed London listed companies host 338 companies in the mining, oil and gas, natural sector, with a combined market value of $586 billion. If you go deeply and you check, you realize that uh, here we have an example of those companies in the, in, the, in, the, in the chart that I'm trying to project here. Let me see if you can see it clearly. Like you see, there's this company called African Potash, which is a corporate agency, mine Potash, but country of operation is Congo. Aquarius Platinum realized that its company, country of operation is South Africa. Bashwell, which is also in Jansi, is Madagascar. Central Rand and Gold Limited also operates, including South Africa. We have Centamine, which is operate, operating, including in Ethiopia. We have Glencore oil which is operating in gold goldstone resource on cooperating jersey operates in gold in gabon ghana and senegal you check the bermuda incorporated companies their companies including togo their companies you check in Cote d'Ivoire, drc which is run gold rand gold which deals with gold is in drc is in mali is in senegal including liberia we have companies in Tanzania, in Cameroon. So these are examples of those companies where they are actually incorporated. Let me move further a bit. Now, UK, the, 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 there's a key factor that is aiding this process, which is the UK foreign policy, the British foreign policy, which is actually facilitating and helping these companies to continue exploiting Africa. It stated, the UK trade and investment policies are enabling British companies to access and control Africa resources. British government, whether conservative or labor, have long been fierce advocates no. of liberalized trade and yeah. investment. Yes, permit me to mute that. Welcome new members who have joined us. I'm going on with the presentation. I'm about, I'm almost midway. I'll be stopping. Those who have not connected their microphone, kindly connect your microphone. Let me proceed. Now, it says that UK trade and investment policies are enabling British companies to access and control African resources. British governments, whether conservative or labor, have long been fierce advocates of liberalized trade and investment regimes in Africa that provide access to market for foreign companies. They have also consistently opposed African countries putting up regulatory or protectionist barriers to such trade and investment. In addition, Britain has been a major advocate for policies promoting low cooperation taxes in Africa. Sorry for that. Let me mute that person. Yeah. Furthermore, the British government have constantly ex exposed voluntary instead of legally binding mechanism to address corporate human rights abuses committed abroad. Such voluntary mechanisms are largely meaningless. The current phase of British scramble for Africa is a continuation of British foreign policies goals since 1945. Then, as now, access to raw materials was a major factor, often the major factor in British foreign policies in Africa. The post-war economic goals of British planners are revealed in declassified documents available at the National Archives. A foreign office report in 1968 stated that the primary goal of foreign policy is to make British economically strong, meaning that we should bend our energies to help produce a world economic climate in which our external trade, our income from invisibles, are, and our balances of payment can prosper. The key to this free 
global trade and increasing our efforts to open up the new markets in Europe, Latin America, and Far East. Two years later, a report entitled Priorities in Foreign Policies noted that the British, Britain needed to promote the protection of our interests in the rest of in the rest of the in the rest of the world from which so many of our raw materials which is derived key regions identify were the middle east south east asia and southern africa another evidence is an earlier cabinet office study from 1959 noted that britain key interests in southern africa were one excluding sino Soviet infiltration and keeping local governments and populations on their side, or at least benevolently neutral. And two, is to develop trade and guarding access to raw materials. Seeing Africa primarily as a source of raw materials and as a field for investment was a direct continuation of pre-war and immediate post-war policies. Foreign Secretary, for example, N.S. Bavin, noted in 1948, for example, that the basic need was to develop the African continent and to make its resources available to all, that is Britain. The key to securing access to raw material was to ensure that other countries establish economic climates favorable to British or Britain and West companies. An interdepartmental Whitehall group noted in 1968 the need in developing countries for an economic and political climate attractive to expatriate capital and the advantages of the status quo both to security and low prices. This priority remains evidence today and explain British policy in Africa far more than the idea that Britain is helping the continent develop through its large aid program. For example, in November 2013, the British government announced a new vehicle for enabling access by British companies to African raw material to be facilitated by British aid. The High Level Prosperity Partnership, which is HLPP, involved foreign office and Department of Internal Development, supporting a range of prominent British oil and mining companies to find new markets. They launched jointly by Foreign Office Minister for Africa, Mark Simons, and International Development Secretary Justin Green. The HLPP aim was to strengthen economic welcome, welcome members can you mute yourself as you join the main aim of this HLPP was to strengthen economic cooperation and trade between the UK and five African countries that was including Angola Cote d'Ivoire Ghana Mozambique and Tanzania these countries were described as five important markets in Africa under their HLPP each country had identified priority sectors where they will welcome investors and partnership from UK. These sectors included extractive industry, agriculture, education, financial, energy, and infrastructure. Four of the five HPP countries, which is Angola, Ghana, Mozambique, and Tanzania, were developing new oil and gas fields. So if you check, Britain's biggest company seeking access to Tanzania recent Discovery of gas is BG Company, which owns 60% of and operates two offshore blocks, gas blocks containing 16 trillion cubic feet of gas, and has investment in the country near of nearly 1 billion pounds. So, in short, if you check the revolving door, which is British mining companies and government officials, there are very close relationship between White Hall and some British mining companies with, with many senior servants leaving their post for directorship on the boards of these companies. To give an example, the Baroness, or the Baroness, which is Shriti Vandera, who was a minister in the Labour government from 2007 to 20, 2009 in DFID, the business department and the cabinet office, is now the director of BHB. Billiton, one of these companies actually exploiting Africa. There's another gentleman called Lord Kerr of Kinlochan, who was in UK diplomatic service for 36 years and became permanent 
under secretary at the foreign office was an, an executive director of Rio Tinto from 2003 to 2015 and deputy chair of Royal Dutch Shell PLC from 2005 to 2012. Another candidate is Anne Grant, who was the foreign office director of, for Africa and the Commonwealth and British High Commissioner to South Africa between 2000 and 2005, is now an, an executive director in Talo Oil, which controls almost 600 million barrels of oil in Kenya. Sir Steve Robson, a former second permanent secretary at the Treasury, retired in 2001, was an, an executive director of the Extracta PLC during 2002 to 2013. Now, according to the London Stock Exchange Group website, the group operates a broad range of international equity bonds and derivatives markets, including London Stock Exchange, through its market and other groupings. The London Stock Exchange Group is, a ra is also running a new training and professional development program in which the group's academy works with up to 50 Tanzanian market operators, regulators, and professionals with the aim to fast track the development of long-term sustainability equity capital market in Tanzania. Let's give example case studies now. For example, the Rio Tinto in Madagascar. Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world and one of the poorest countries. It's famous for the, its biodiversity. Is a home of thousands of species of plants and animals. But if you check down there, one major product in Madagascar is QIT Madagascar Mineral and QMM, which is 80% owned by the British mining giant called Rio Tinto. The Madagascan government holds the remaining 20% interest. QMM mining operation is near Fort Dufin on the southeast tip of Madagascar and covers an area around 6,000 hectares. Is operation, is, is operation, the operation is expected to last for 40 years and involve investment of $940 million in the country. The projects extract ilmenite, which is used in titanium and as a pigment in toothpaste, paint, and sunscreen. The, the Fort Dauphin deposit also contains nearly 70 million tons of ilmenite according to around 10% of the world market. This is an example in Tanzania, in, in, in Madagascar. Now, Rio Tinto Company had earnings of $9.3 billion in 2014. It has 60,000 staffs, works in over 40 countries, and headquarters in London. In reality, it's exporting resources from Madagascar. If you go to another company, for example, huh? I don't know what they're saying. What is this for? It's, it's, it's just that out of the way. Okay, to members who are joining us, I'd like to remind you that we are trying to review the report by Warren Want, which was done in 2016 on the British companies that are controlling energies and minerals in Africa. And I've been going on with the review of the reports, and we are doing some case studies as where I am in different countries, as we've checked in Madagascar. We also have, these are the mines in Madagascar, mine fields in Madagascar. If you go in the southwest of Sahara, like for example, Morocco invaded the West Sahara in 1975. But if you go all along, you realize that in 2013, the British, in 2013, British and London listed companies like Kain Energy, based in Edinburgh, secured 20% interest in Cap Jibua exploration block. And if you go along, you'll realize that uh, in the West Sahara, they also have a Glencore company, which is also controlling almost took over 18.7% interest in the Fon Ogin block, which is also doing mining there. You check Sun Leon Energy Company, it's also in the West, Western Africa or West Sahara. We have Petro Maroc Corporation. We have New Age Africa Global Company, which is registered in Jersey with an apparent head office in London and holds operation of 56% stakes in for home origin exploration in West Sahara. If you go, for example, a country like in, in Zambia, we have a company called uh, Glen, Glencore. And realize that mining giant like Glencore, which is registered in Jersey, is one of the world's largest diversified natural resource company and a producer and a marketer of 90 commodities worldwide. Glencore had a revenue of $233 billion in 2013. 
yeah. just under 10 times the GDP of Zambia. And if you go along, you realize that uh, Glencoe in Zambia uh, operates in areas of course like Mopani copper mines and consists of four underground copper belt mines in the town of Kitwe and an underground mine in Mufulira. Vendata, which is registered in London with the head office in Mumbai, India, also managed three copper mines in Zambia. So these are part of examples of, of course companies that are trying to exploit Zambia. For example, in Zambia in 2010, Zambia produced 5.7 billion worth of copper, but only earned revenue from this of just 633 million dollars. Please repeat that. Repeat that. In Zambia, in 2010, Zambia produced 5.7 billion worth of copper, but earned revenues from this of just 633 million dollars. If you check, you realize again, like for example, in that in 2011, the Zambia government earned 1.3 billion revenues from a mining based in copper production worth 7.23 billion dollars. So these are also some of the low wages, and they always try to ensure that they, they devalue the, the value of the commodity so that it's not a capture the actual amount so that they can evade tax. You check, for example, they're saying in 2011, annual report, that its production was, the Glencore company, its production was around $890 million before costs. Yet Mopani paid the government just $375 million, which is $77 million pounds. Well, its worth was 890 million pounds. They only paid 77 million pounds. And these have been going on in many parts, including the Vedata company, which is also exploiting Zambia, as, as you can see there. You go, for example, in countries like, there's also pollution as an aspect. They are polluting on our environment. These mining companies, like in the Glencore company in, Z in Zambia, is ex exclusively polluting the environment in Zambia. So other cases also include, of course, the killings of our people. You realize that British mining companies are implicated in several killing, cases of killing of protesters or mine workers in recent years. Most notorious and well-known one is the case of Lonmi, which is in, of course, South Africa. London listed and London headquartered Lonmi control 42.9 million ounces of platinum, which is worth 46 billion from its mine in South Africa, mainly the Maricana mine in Northwest. In August 2012, 34 workers were killed and 78 injured in Maricana after South African police opened fire on the striking miners, miners who had long demanded pay rise to living wages standard and a decent housing facility. Lonmin has been accused of escalating violence through providing evidence assistance and means to support the police crackdown. A transcript of a meeting between Lonmin and police submitted to the government inquiry into the massacre suggests that the company officials worked with the police chiefs to formulate a joint plan to break the strike, including lobbying politicians and police to extra police presence and providing resources and intelligence to the police. It was alleged that the former Lonmin and executive director and a senior African National Congress politician, Cyril Ramaphosa, pressured other high-ranking politicians to increase police intervention in the protest. However, in 2015, a report by the South African Government Inquiry Commission concluded that there was no sufficient evidence to prove the active contribution of Lonmin to the killing. But it did attribute responsibility to Lonmin for failing to address workers' demands, lack of necessary safeguards, and measures to ensure its, work, its workers' safety. Families of the victim, disappointed by the funding and pursuing other means to hold the company to account for all its illegal involvement in the massacre, NGOs have also raised concern about the continuing negative social and environmental impact of loaning mining operation. Loaning says it has taken a number of steps to build more transparent and trustworthy working environments. In 2013, 12 local villagers brought a lawsuit in the UK against the company over deaths and injuries as a result of excessive use of force by mine security and police officers. In 2015, Akasha Mining settled the case of out of court 
while denying the claims, but the full details of the settlement remain undisclosed. Concerns were raised that while out-of-court settlement benefited some victims, many of others were not including the lawsuit were hindered from participating in the company grievances machines. There's also relocations, where large-scale mining routinely require evicting people from their homes, and Britain companies are promoting a number of projects involving such resettlement. In these processes, people are rarely given a choice to move or not. They are simply asked what kind of compensation they want, which often takes the form of alternative land or cash. So there, for example, there's this company called Aurelius Mining, which is a Canadian base listed on the London Stock Exchange. With three gold mines projects in Liberia, containing 1.6 million ounces of gold. Its Liberty Gold Project in Western Liberia, first commercial gold mine in the country, involved the relocation of 325 households with 2,066 people from towns in Kinjor and Lanjor, which the company said will be accompanied by a range of livelihood restoration programs. Reports in 2014 suggested that they, while the residents of Kinjor and Lanjor had agreed to relocate, given that the company had promised them better housing, some had mixed feelings over the relocation process. By September 2014, Oris reported that all people had been relocated to a temporary houses, that the focus was now completing the reconstructions. By late 2015, the local people were still complaining about the failure of the company to build them new permanent homes, as promised. As they contributed to, they continued to live in temporary houses built by mud and, and sticks. These are part of, of course, forceful relocation anywhere they do their mining, where they move our people. Of course, possible displacement alongside borders concerns are also evident in operation of major Anglo-Irish companies. For example, in Kenya, Talo Oil, Talo Oil, which is incorporated in UK and listed in London Stock Exchange, controls 50 to 65 percent interest and operation five offshore oil blocks in west at north west of Kenya which contain 600 million barrels of oil and cover over 48,000 48, kilometers square. The company activities are focused on Turkana County, the largest and poorest one of the most marginalized counties in Kenya, where there have been tensions between the company and the local community in light of the latter uncertainty, uncertainty about the extent which they will benefit or lose out from the mining. In October 2013, for example, the protests erupted when hundreds of locals demanded to be offered major jobs in the mine, forcing Talo to temporarily suspend its operation. Recent consultation among people affected and oil exploration found that the perception of the local communities in Turkana country are shaped by, among other things, lack of information and false information. Of course, people in Turkana, in the Turkana oil areas, mentioned poor and non existent community consultation especially perceived too close or too comfort relationship between the oil companies, certain community leaders, and politicians. So these are still also evidences of such things. We have la labor rights violation. For example, in Belzon Mining Company, incorporated in New Jersey, which managed two iron mines in Guinea, is another British company accused of illegal labor practice. For example, in 2014, Guinea Minister of Mines warned the company that it had wrongfully dismissed local employees in addition to failing to produce plan for the safe transport of iron ore. The government new technical committee charged with reviewing Guinea mining sector also led that the Belzon had engaged in an approved transfer of one of its mining licenses to a affiliated company and a separate occasion played to sell its mineral rights without approval. There's also tax dodging. For example, as you can see, Kenma resource Resources, which is an Irish company listed in the London Stock Exchange, the Moma Mine in North Mozambique, which is extracting mineral sand worth tens of billions of dollars. When the mine began in 2007, Kenma was given extremely favorable terms, including contract secrecy, no corporate taxes for one part of the company group, and halving of corporate rate, tax rate for 10 years. But in 2013, it was found that Kenma had yet to pay any corporate income tax from 2007. Also, we have other companies like DHP, which I mentioned some of the officials are part of it. 
who are also not actually paying their rightful tax. So in conclusion, as I come to the end, the scale of involvement in the exploration or exploitation of African mineral, oil, and gas resources is triggered, is staggering. The number of companies involved, the resource wealth they control, and the profit they siphon away are astonishing. This leaves African countries losing tens of billions every year, with a higher, with a higher than some countries' GDP. While Africa is stripped bare of its resources and of its revenue, leaving its poorer still, it still remains one of the main beneficiaries of British aid. Now, according to one want partners in Africa, they have been demanding that mining be done differently, where mining revenues predominantly stay in the country, where raw materials are processed in the country, where it is mined to promote maximum value addition, where community interests take precedence over extraction and profit, and where governments are able to hold corporate companies to account for the human rights violation. The UK and other North, Northern governments have consistently argued against raw material being processed in Africa. Together with institutions such as World Bank, they have effectively argued that Africa should continue effectively as a primary source resource provider, exporting and process raw materials and making other northern countries rich from the processing of these materials. This approach to the mining in Africa, in Africa is centuries old and has resulted to no benefit for African economy, African workers and African community. Some of the recommendations that were put forward by this organization include the UK government should not be supporting primary ex resource extraction by UK domicile and UK listed companies. Instead, the focus should be on maximizing the potential of resources, resource wealth for the development of countries in the global south. This means seeing Africa as not just the low cost supplier of raw material, but as also a producer of, of manufactured and processed material, which have a higher value than raw material. It also says, a comment that we should also be supporting African countries in imposing tax obligation and royalty rates on the resources that are extracted by the Northern corporations. In addition, the global shadow financial system that facilitates illicit financial flows and corporate tax avoidance through secrecy law, tax haven, shell companies need to be dismantled. This requires global tax rules to be rewritten, for fair and transparent international tax rule to be established. Countries in Africa need equal involvement. Pressure needs to be put on the UK government to stop supporting a system that enables multinational domicile or listed in the UK to avoid paying taxes where they operate, which is facilitated by UK tax havens. They also recommend that there's a need to be demanding that the British government enforce corporate accountability of British companies operating in Africa. These companies should not be allowed to get away with the labor violation, human rights abuses, and environmentally degrading that is currently taking on. So those are the conclusion of these remarks, and these are the graphic representations of where the minings are taking place. So permit me to end it here and open up the floor for people who might have uh, actually, a reaction or response to this report. Thank you very much. The floor is now open for members. If you want to give anything or any input, kindly feel free to raise up your hand and react to this. I'll be calling members based on that. Just raise up your hands. Once I see your hand is up, I'll be able to call you. Yes, Victor. Okay, thank you so much, comrade. So it's a very, very important conversation that we need to have today. And I always say that every conversation that, that, that we are having as Pan-Africans is always very important because it is what constitutes or uh, is what make our society complete. And on the companies that we're looking today, I feel like there is a very very big monopoly they've built onto the in onto the in the continent and this monopoly is something that did not start 50 years ago 
there are people who are building for the parent companies um, who did the slavery, the explosion at the, at the beginning of the slavery aspect of it. The, the people took part. So they'll, they'll be building up on, on the... Sorry. <coughs> Victor, are you done? Yeah, sorry, sorry for that. Yes, yes, I was saying that there are people who are building up on the monopoly or the explosion that took place. And if you can trace even their years or the years that they've been in the space, it's quite long. Another thing that is very, very, very vital, that if you check the debt structure or the debts that every country is owing in Africa, 40% is always not even talked about. That is called the private bonds. These are bonds that are majorly contributed by these major companies because they are things that are involved in the government. In uh, They give a lot of support to the government in a way. So over 40% of our Africa's debt uh, is majorly on the bonds. But on the other side, if you're looking, the reality is that the amount of money that is like flowing through the con illegally, Ill let me say illicit fi financial flows that are flowing into the continent are immediately contributed by these guys. And the major part of it, because they don't be in the part of, uh, of, of like more of, uh, more of like paying the taxes. So they evade the tax. That is a very big thing that they, that like making us to kill. Why? Because they have built a monopoly that is able to influence when now the government is operating. And these are things that they created a systematic framework. That's why I was saying that. I always say that they've built a monopoly on a system that for you to win, they are, they are able to to put a put a put you on the throat throat wherever uh, angle. And also, if you check out uh, uh, how they're like monopolizing other critical sectors that, 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 that you're saying that there are other companies that are now going to agriculture, the energy, all of those sectors. That is a way they spread. The parent is one. The issue is to spread and monopolize on everything. Today, if, for example, Kenya want to violate any of the international agreements or policies, they simply say that we are, we are not going to be exporting maize to you. And there's nothing the government can do about that. Why? Because they have monopolized the agricultural sector through this. So the issue is, at the bedrock of it all, is that they have created a systematic uh, framework which is there. And of all these uh, minerals, mostly, I, I, I was really sad when I was hearing you say about Malawi, Zambia. Yes, yeah, Zambia only earning, like, got that amount of money. The reality of the fact is uh, that to me, I always see that as long as Africa will be able to earn on the royalties. Because if you see all these minerals we are talking about, we have them, they are here in Canada, they come and manufacture it. But the agreement that, that you are going to be getting, that most of our governments committed to, no, no, not just 10 years, but even years, so many years back, was they are going to be earning on royalties. Royalties less than 1% of the whole amount of money. And they have to go to that agreement because there's nothing that always type people like agreement. There are things that you can never pass through. So my uh, key submission to this important question is that as long as they have built monopoly, as long as they have uh, had this essence of exploiting, because even let me say, I'll, even yesterday I was writing an, an article and I was saying that the global economic system is framing up to a point whereby we Africa must depend on it. Yet, most of the aspect of our our everything produced is there. So, in, in the extractive industry, Africa we pro, we we export and processed. We earn through royalties that is less than one percent. We only be at the consumers, and what we consume is also less less quality, which means the damp one is like we are, we are just a damp site of something that we used there. So it's a sad reality that, 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 that we have to look through, but I think that we are the right people to make this a reality of change because there's no nobody else who's thinking 
uh, or bring, if it is our leaders okay. that we're going to be depending on for this to happen, it is a big lie. But we have to restrain them to the right framework and right shape uh, so that they're able to acknowledge that, yes, private bourbons are killing us, but as much as they want us to know that, yes, we know corruption is very deep inside the continent, but it can never go beyond the illicit financial flows because that is a very, very bigger, like, see the amount of money here, this money are flowing within our continent, our, our amount of money living as is so huge, so huge, so huge. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, uh, let me go to Sister Ida. Sister Ida? Sorry. Uh, uh, wow. Victor, um, let me go to uh, Sister Ida. You'll come back later. Yes, Sister Ida, and then Kwame Goza. I, I was wondering if maybe you could um you could post the the red um Africa picture, I think of the mines, the last one that you showed in this CSG group, because it's yeah, that red one. Because it's very hard to read on um on a phone, but you know, we can enlarge it and read it if if you could possibly post that so we can see it clearer. Well in the group. That would be really good. Thank you. That's I, 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 I thought, oh, I'd love to see that for real, yes. So okay, thank you. And I'll thank you that. for the um, for what you've had to say. It's been good. Thank you. Thank you, sister Aida. Yes, uh, uh, Brother Kwame. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Pigeon, and thank you everyone who is on the platform. Yeah, it is very good. Uh, uh, I think it was Otieno who, who spoke first, right? Yes, it was Otieno who spoke first. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very good observation he has made, um, uh, especially when it comes to Africa's problem. So this really speaks to the fundamental problem affecting uh, our continent. And of course, we are not the first. Uh, all these guys, uh, they were on one organization. They are not the NGO. They are not the first people to see this problem. Uh, the first person to see this problem was majorly uh, Nkrumah, who post published his, uh, you know, groundbreaking work, uh, neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, and of course one of the reasons why the Americans rushed to remove him from power because he was ex, you know, exposing uh, these schemes of these multinationals. He traced all these multinationals and cataloged them in the book and showed how these multinationals, all of them are integrated or interlocked. He, he used to use the word uh, interlocked with the United States Department of Defense, Pentagon, and then the CIA, how they are integrated together with their media platforms. So they are working all together. Like if you look at uh, some of the reports which have been published by, tri, tri, I think it's Tricontinental, uh, something, I've forgotten the name, fully uh, uh so the united states has around 30 military bases on the african continent so this shows you that the purpose of those military bases is to protect these corporations while, while they are extracting uh these resources and it is important like how uh, otieno has uh you know observed that we understand africa's problem as majority of the people have been uh, I don't know, uh, made to believe that it is corruption. It is not really corruption, Africa's problem. Africa's biggest problem is not corruption. Africa's biggest problem is imperialism, which is extracting the continent and has impoverished the continent, the billions, trillions, and trillions of dollars which are flowing out of this continent. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. I've actually posted one of the reports by the United the United Nations of 2021, which was, was published, and they were claiming that it's, uh, it is the illicit financial outflows. They are claiming that it's around $89 billion, which is flowing out of the continent uh, on an annual basis. But we know that the UN itself is, is a neocolonial you know, institution. But Pan-Africanists have been saying that the money flowing out of Africa is, is around $200 billion. So the UN came off this report and claimed it's, it's around $89 billion and, and, and approximately, of course, $100 billion. But even this is extremely high. This is a lot of money because we have an infrastructure deficit 
on the African continent of around $200 billion. So these $100 billion, which is flowing out, which is robbery, this is stealing. They are stealing from Africa. But of course, the word is framed as you know, financial, illicit financial outflow. Instead of saying that it is robbery, they are stealing from, from Africa. They want to claim that it is uh, illicit financial outflow. Uh, now, Nkrumah, of course, mentioned this, and, 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 and we acknowledge that Africa's problem, biggest problem, is not really the, the so-called corruption and all these problems which they keep uh, misleading people to believe, but it is actually the imperialist exploitation. It's the neocolonialism, as we are seeing, that is impoverishing their people, that is taking the resources which belong to the people. And this takes us back to President Magufuli. When he came to power, he saw this problem and he tried to block it. And when he blocked it, you can see how much he achieved in a period of five years. In a period of five years. So now this tells us as Pan-Africanists as that, that we have to understand what Nkrumah was talking about. The unification of Africa, we have to stop rationalizing about the unification of Africa. It is not a luxury whereby we come and start rationalizing. When we start talking about the unification of Africa, people start rationalizing as if this is a luxury. This is a matter of existence. This is existential issue. This is an existential issue for us as, as a people. If you look at how much they are robbing us, how much they are stealing us, simply because we are fragmented, simply because we are fragmented, something which Nkrumah gave a solution for and said, you people have to unite if you don't want to be ex exploited. Wars which are being planted all across the continent, all these wars are strategic instruments for the continued extraction of, of resources. You have seen Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, when they came together to try to solve their own problems, they have put a, a, you know, a, a, a stop to this you know, terrorist incursion into the region. But these guys are using this and claiming there's ISIS. ISIS was defeated a long time ago in the Middle East, but they are claiming that ISIS is, is now in Africa. Randy Paul, you know, one of the congressmen in the United Nations, I mean, in the United States, was speaking recently. And he said ISIS was, was defeated a long time ago. There's no ISIS. The United States military should return. We should bring our troops home. But they are claiming that ISIS is in Africa. This is how they are claiming. So this, these are strategic tools which are being used to continue that ex extraction of, of resources of the African continent. So now what do we do for us as a people? So the solution is for us to fight as much as possible for the unification of Africa. The groups are there and it is up to us to make our contribution, whatever we can, but we don't just have to make whatever we can. We don't have to contribute whatever we can, but we have to contribute all we can, everything we can. We have to give it the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Kwame. Uh, let me go to Sister Marlin, then uh, Ipsi. Sister Marlin? I, um, yeah, I'm able to stay in today because I'm not feeling that brilliant. But um, my contribution is how will we, <clears throat> will we be able to defeat this horrendous situation? Because they've got the leaders in Africa in their pockets. And if they've got the leaders in their pockets, and then um, they're the one making the deals with the leaders and the leaders are agreeing. The problem won't be able to solve. The leaders have either got to become strong, which they won't, because, the, you know, they're enjoying the good life because they have em ambassadors, they have all kind of peoples that is um, enjoying um, 
what is going on, the elites, let's say, enjoying what's going on. It's not affecting them. And over generation, they're used to seeing their citizen poor and they become, you know, immune to it. It's like it's not a problem for them. So I don't know. It, it's, it's quite really sad to think what will change because even Niger and Benin and um, the other countries that managed to take over, they're plotting something to bring them down. And within how many months, the guy that's taken over, the country, things have improved already. So if they were to be able to do things the way it needs to be done, you wouldn't have all this poverty in Africa. Um, you know, Africa's got what all of the world need, especially the Western world. So I don't know if there's a way out of it. Uh, thankfully, the younger generation you know, is uprising against it, but we have no real army, we have no, nothing to protect us. So one of the first thing they do is put sanction on you and sanction cripples a nation. And then they manage to create chaos with one group of people um, fighting the other. So. I really don't see a way out. Uh, um, has anyone got any suggestion how to deal with it? Maybe the first thing is get rid of those leaders, but how do you do that? I, I will respond to you, Malet, uh, if uh, uh, Pigeon allows me, Comrade Pigeon allows me. Okay, all right. That's all I have to say. And I'm glad, although I'm not feeling brilliant, but I'm glad I was able to listen because... It's, um, you know, it's, it's good to know what really is going on because like somebody said, all we hear is leaders, corruption, corruption, but there's more to it than just the leaders' corruption. And as somebody said, they're being supported with their corruption. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll come to you, Brother Akwame, but let me take one person first. And I come to you to give us your suggestion on regards to system. I'm all in question on what should be done in terms of our leadership. Ipsi, can you come in? Then I'll go to Kwame to give his reaction to that. Ipsi? Shalom, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I think um, what I wanted to, to comment, it will also touch based on the question that has just been raised. Because what I want to raise is that um, we Africans, we need to be clear what we want um, so that we can unify. We will never ever unify if we, we, we don't have um, a common ground that we build our foundation from. It's either we, we, we want our liberation um, or we just want to survive. I'm raising this because um, in as much as we are busy um, with so many programs, so many groups, um, at some point, it seems like um, we, we're not clear what we want. Um, at some point, it seems like we want to sustain the colonial system and try to correct it to feed into it. Um, where else? We, we are able to start to, to develop our own. I believe that what we need is to develop a parallel system, not even to de develop, but to restore our ancient path. Go back to the crossroad, seek the ancient path where good life is. And when we have found it, we need to walk it. I am of the th belief that until we Africans determine or clear on what we want 
and until we are prepared for humble beginnings, where we will be developing our own system and our own economy, restoring our own kingdoms. We have, currently we are busy trying to, for me, um, it's like we are we are taking a worn out shirt that has been torn by dogs and we're busy trying to sew it and patch, you know, but it's 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 done, you know. How about we get a new material and sew a new shirt? That will be very effect uh, cost effective. I'm raising this concern because if, uh, as long as you don't own, I always say to our people, even if you want to be a business person, as long as you don't own source of production, you can't claim yourself to be a business person. You're just a distributor. Now, this is somebody else's system. He designed it for himself. Now, for us to try to fight to belong to that system and try to correct it and whatsoever, it's not going to take us anywhere. Coming back to what I said when I, what I what I said um, on we need to be clear what we want. We are nature based people, and we need we are spiritual. We need to comprehend that we need to be in harmony with nature. However, this system and its industrialization. It's harmful to nature. Now, do we continue to destroy nature or do we develop our own system that is in harmony with nature? Those are the things that um, I want to bring to our attention. Now, we've got, um, uh, um, we've got our system whereby we used to have our community, we used to have our kings, where people were governing, where we used to come together in a, what we call a quota, you know, in a crawl, and we will have a level of, 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 of protocols and an organogram and a, level, a means of communication. But whatever the king will decide, the king was just there saving. Um, as the central point, but the law was coming from the people. We need a system that allows people to govern. The problem in South Africa is not the same problem in Zimbabwe, and it will never be the same problem in Tanzania, neither in Ghana or in Equatorial Guinea or in Senegal or whatsoever. Now, even in South Africa, the problem in Northwest province, it will never be the same as the problem in Gauteng province or Wazulu Natal or Eastern Cape or whatsoever. Even with the Northern, Northwest problem, problem, the problem is not the same according to different towns within the province. Even within different towns, the problem is not the same according to different villages and locations and suburbs. But if people govern, every people will come up with a law that is suitable for them based on their situation and circumstances. For example, if you are to look into the COVID, what, what happened during the COVID era? A law was decided um, by the World Health Organization. It's a foreign law that was imposed on us when you look into European and American countries, that law was uh, uh, didn't inconvenience them. Um, the, 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 the lockdown, the shutting off, stopping of business and all those things didn't inconvenience them as much as it did for us in Africa. And it caused more frustration for us than it caused for them. But if we were governing, we were able to say, um, we do things this way. The only president I recall who stood up at that time 
was President Mangufuli. And he stood up for his people. I remember reading an article. It was read, written by somebody who was touring um, Tanzania and he got locked in Tanzania. I loved his research. Tanzania didn't obey the, 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 the uh, COVID rules. And this researcher said his research was based on the fact that he went to the graveyards when he said that COVID was not striking, even if Tanzania was not submissive. COVID was not striking Tanzania. He went to the graveyards. He looked into the number of graves. They were not raising, you know, and he looked into the dates of the graves that were there. It was old graves. And I got to experience the site. But or, or in other uh, places, you know, in other countries, then that was clear that people were more killed by heart attacks and frustration. But all of this is because we are governed by the law that was never designed by us for us. So we, in short, um, let me not take too long. We need to focus on what we want and how we go about it. What we need is a parallel system that we are going to develop for ourselves where our people are going to govern and we are going to say, I am in a rural area. I'm content with my rural lifestyle and I just want to enjoy and live in harmony with nature. And I'm going to be left alone and I'll be having rest to complain and say, please don't contaminate my rivers for that is my source of water. Don't contaminate, one, two, three, don't contaminate. We will have laws that says that when you farm in our land, you don't use chemicals. You don't use one, two, three. When you do whatever, you don't do it in this because we'll be in line with protecting nature. So um, let me just pause there, but I wanted to highlight that what we need to be clear what we want. I'm humbled. Thank you, sister, for that passionate word of course. Not even passionate is actually thought-provoking. Indeed, uh, as we have always been saying this, is very clear that uh, we just even do need, as you've said, to build a system. We need to actually bring back our system. And in the process, we are actually coded in these their systems. And somebody once suggested that we need to decode it. But at the end of the day, we agree, we agree with this. And uh, I think it's part of the initiative. We're also thinking of how can Pan-African organizations sit together, those in the legal department, those who are doing it, with the laws, constitution, and the rest. How can we have a Pan-African committee where all individuals and organizations dealing with legal issues across the Africa can sit in one forum, be it virtual or where? Then they discuss and look at Africa again and review the African old traditional ruling system and come up with a template. Even if you take them a year, let them come up with a template. There's actually what you need for Africa. Then let's push that for ratification because it's time that we need not to revive things and put together. So irrespective of where you come from, which organization you belong to, but as long as you're a Pan-African dealing with in economics, we need to come together in one committee of African and the economics committee. Let's sit there, if it's virtually, because we have an advantage of technology. Why don't we bring all experts and all organizations sit together Let's review back our traditional economic systems and look at this economic system. Then come up with a blueprint for an African economic system. How do you want to view it? How do you want to do economics as Africans? And this is the direction now we must move and probably as we look forward to 2024, that's the action point we must now start moving to so that we can produce what is meant for us and what is for us. At least we come up with a blueprint that we want for Africa and let's go out and mobilize for its implementation or ratification so that we can start moving. Anyway, these are just a few things we are thinking of because indeed, we must go back to that. We must go back to what you're saying. If you don't go back to our roots, we might not be able to know where we're moving. It's like you lost direction and they're trying to move with their compass. We'll still be lost forever. But let me hear what Coco wants to say. Oh, brother Kwame, you wanted to respond on something before I forget. Then I'll go to Coco. Kwame, are you still here, Goza? Yes, I'm here. Um, I now, wanted to can you proceed to... before I move to Coco? Yes, uh, uh, I think Malin was asking, what do we do now? The fact that uh, 
uh, about the fact that these people are working, of course, with some elements within uh, the continent to deprive uh, the majority of the people, the masses of the people, of these resources and impoverish the people. Um, so uh, my answer is that uh, you see, we don't have a one size uh, fits all. We don't have a predetermined, and this is a huge problem. I always con con compare Africa's uh, position and the status, current status, with what happened in China. You see, China was, you know, aggressed, was attacked by the West, including the United States, German, you know, Portugal, and all these. When you hear of Macau, Macau was being dominated by Portugal, you know, Hong Kong was dominated by England, and, and all that kind of stuff. But the Chinese intellectuals sat down and saw China being decimated, its culture being destroyed. And they say, what do we do about this problem? So people like Mao, uh, Mao Zedong, just like what you are seeing we are doing now, we are deliberating what must be done. And this is how everything starts. Now, Mao, when they were starting out to find a solution to China's problem, and the fact that it's being dominated, Britain went there. If you if you've heard of about the if you have heard of the, the opium wars, they forced China to take opium by force and they came and bombed it and they forced the people to take opium. And China went through that what they call the century of humiliation. So they were through it for almost a hundred years. That's why they call it, that's why they call it the, the century of humiliation. Uh, the economy, which was the biggest economy in the world, was decimated by these British and, and, and these Caucasians. Now, Africa has been through it for almost six centuries, 600 years. So we have some similarities to China, but we have been in need for much longer, which means our predicament is even much more difficult. Now, I brought this to show you that there's no one size fits all. There's no predetermined solution, but the solutions have to be tested. You have to go to the ground and test. Things have to go beyond uh, discussion. And then you start testing instead of saying, oh, you, you look, if one person sits and they look at their solution and say, my solution is this, or these things are supposed to be approached in this way and you condemn the others and say, well, they, they don't know what they're doing and stuff like that. Oh, this one doesn't work. Oh, this one is this, that one is that. There's no predetermined solution to this predicament because it is an extremely difficult problem. So we have, but the but, but the, the 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 end of it is that we have to come together and start testing some of these solutions. Because you test something, you test the solution, and it doesn't work, and you come back and learn. This is what Nkuma calls. Uh, thought and action. Thought without action is empty. You know, action without thought is blind and stuff like that. What he's trying to say is that you practice and then practice informs thought because when you practice something that doesn't work, you come back and think about it and then you strategize again and you go back with a different strategy. So this is what definitely uh, he's trying to mean by uh, thought and action as we move forward. When it comes to the African heads of state, and those ones who are collaborating, it's not that all of them are collaborating with the system in impoverishing the people, but of course, the majority of them are collaborating with the system. And these are, these are the problems. But when you go back to the colonial period, the whole continent was dominated. It was not even African heads of state who were dominated. It was dominated by imperialism completely. So ask yourself, how did people like Nkuma, those people, generation that time, the young people that generation, how did they manage to achieve whatever they achieved? They started by agitating. 1945, when they sat in Manchester, no one even thought that they would be able to do anything about it. They issued declarations and stuff like that. People were just laughing at them. You see, they were just laughing at them because imperialism was dominant all over. The, it had taken over the whole continent. So we start small. There is parties, our parties, is on the ground already, the Africa Continental Unity Party. We are strategizing 
and we are on the ground. We are not just talking about things. We are not, you know, just on WhatsApp chatting. And this is, I believe, where we are supposed all of us to focus our energy, to look for those people who are really doing the work on the ground and support them and ask them, go and see what they are doing. Go and see what these people are doing and ask them, what are you guys doing and where can I contribute? I mean, this is what is needed because we need the resources and you can't do this work without the resources. Like one of the challenges which we are facing is the resources. So if we want to go forward, then this is how we have to look at things. The solutions are there, but I cannot tell you that they are predetermined. And these people you are seeing, their challenges themselves, who are collaborating with the imperialism in the continued extraction of the continent. But that was definitely the original motive of imperialism even coming here, to extract labor, take labor, and then when Africans fought against slavery and they defeated it, then they came back with colonialism to continue that extraction process. So people like Nkuma wanted to interrupt that, they overthrew him and removed it because they want to have that control over your material resources and then push you down, continue and push you down and stab you so that they can have paved the roads and have these skyscrapers and have everything they need in their okay. countries. You, you will live like, uh, you know, beggars and, and all that kind of stuff. So for us to do uh, 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 and, and produce a counter to this problem or produce a solution to this problem, we have to work together. And for me, I've shown you that we already have some things which we are doing. What we need is we want others to come and join us, regardless of where you are, you know, whatever you can contribute, it is welcome, but it makes it possible that you feel part of something that is producing a solution to something that you have grievance over, instead of us always just grieving and feeling bad about a problem, but you get a chance to participate in solving, I mean, these problems. So in any country, the SUP, what it has done is that, the, you know, the African continent 20 party is that you are in your country, you, so you base there and you start strategizing from there and you form the SUP over there and you use your own terrain to find the solutions on, on, on if you think that your, you know, your part of the country is unique and it requires different solutions, then you use those solutions uh, to attend to those problems. But our goal, all of us, is to come together and solve especially the, the, the problems which are common to us. We have problems which are common to us, like we want all okay, of us okay. to eat. We all want to dress, we all want school, we want good health, all these, we can only solve them if we are working together. And they start with the stopping of those who are extracting us and, and exploiting us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brother Gonza. Uh, Brother Coco, are you here? Uh, I'm here, brother. Many thanks for for this opportunity sure. and uh, a, a very good presentation. Will you kindly share the 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 study in the in the chat? I've been putting lots chat? and lots of yeah in this in chat the or in our group. In, in this chat and also in in is our it, group as well. Yeah, it it is in a it is in a document format. I don't know if it's I'm capable of putting a document into the. All chat. right, it's fine. Don't worry. We'll see how we share it. After. But I'll have it in the group. I'll share it in the group immediately so that you can never forward it. Thank you, sir. Thank it's, you it's, it's, it's a, it is a public report. It's not our report. In fact, we are yep. just going through a review of this report. So it's a public report. Public. in public domain. Thank you very much. So uh, on to my, my points. The points I have are, are, are simple. Um, it's unfair to compare China with Africa. I like my brother... Kwame Konza, what he's saying, he is always spot on when he talks about all of these issues because he has been doing a lot of work. So lots of respect to you, my brother. But I would like to remind you that Africa was parceled into different uh, pieces, 52, 54, whatever you want to, to say. So the problem we have, even though Nkuma said unite and uh, as a united power, 
you should be able to overcome all of this. The, that division persists up to today. So we have been misled into believing that the small nation states we have are strong enough to withstand whatever foreign power comes in and wants whatever it wants to do in Africa. That is the biggest problem we have as Africans. And we have never had to go through a revolution. We only got a flag, a, a national anthem, independence in the 60s. All of us. The problem is we live in denial. We still think we are independent or we think we have all the control over our resources, over our, our everything. But look at how many of us go back to the IMF time and again or to the World Bank seeking for help. But unfortunately, it's on purpose because we have those uh, puppet leaders who are the representatives of the foreign powers who ruled us before independence. So in a way, what Brother Kwame said, colonialism is ongoing. But in this case, it's coming in in a new format, military industry complex, corporate power. The corporate, they are strong enough to take over democracy. Democracy doesn't exist. You only vote and you feel like you have done something. But no, power lies somewhere else. I've shared a document in there, which is written by Matt Kennard and Claire Provost, who shows how this system works, but it's largely the corporates. And that started with uh, United Foods Industry, United Foods, uh, I can't remember what, what it was called. It was ruling Cuba. And that's what Fidel Castro with his friends and Che Guevara came in and removed it from power. And that's why Cuba has been under sanctions since that time until now, because the neo-colonialists want back what used to belong to them. So the problem we have is, is uh, to, to, to solve it is simple. We need to take back the power which belongs to us as the people. The problem, we, we, are, we are always making apologies as if the power doesn't belong to the people. The power belongs to us as the people. There is no reason why Africans are starving and Africa is the richest continent in the world. And Africans are sitting on top of the materials that are used to serve all the other economies, all of them. But unfortunately, we have been indoctrinated by what we call Christianity. We have been told, blessed are those like the children, because they, the kingdom of God belongs to them. And we all believe that. We don't realize that if the Buddhists had come in, we would have been Buddhists. Is the Muslims had come in before, we'll have been Muslims. It's, it's that, it's as simple as that. And we need to think carefully, but we are not engaging our mental faculties to think for ourselves. And that is how they want us. That's how the system works. It doesn't want people who think critically. We need to think critically as Africans and find common ground. I like it, Sister Ipsy, you said common ground, but you and Brother Pigbin, you need to start seeing things from a common ground. You need to have a, that common perspective. You need to realize that there is a lot more that connects you than what divides you. And that is what happens everywhere. That's why we have millions of Pan-African groups all over the internet, all over WhatsApp, all over Facebook. And we cannot unite over a common, simple purpose. That, that is what is needed. Thank you, my brother. Uh, I do appreciate your contributions. Indeed, Isa, we are having 12 minutes to end our class and I'll be going to Sister Ida. But can you imagine that there are companies that are controlling 371,132 kilometer square of land in Africa. They are actually mining our resources and they're making over 1.5 1.05 trillion dollars annually out of our resources then you're poor what must be done in order for us to reclaim our 371 kilometers square thousand kilometers square of land 
and what can be done to ensure that we don't continue to lose over one trillion that they take away from us. So they take one trillion dollars from us, we go beg for their loans of maybe some million dollars. Something must be done. Sister Ida? Um, I wanted to uh, make a comment that, you know the, the poster that you showed us that I said, oh, I couldn't see, but when I could see it, I saw that it had Glencoe that kept popping up in all the different countries. And I think until we start finding out who, you know, how many um, countries all these um, companies are in, I thought, oh, maybe I've missed your presentation on Glencoe. So I went to the, um, uh, what's it, to find out. And I see that they say they're in 35 different countries. The red, it was yeah, Glencoe. Glencoe yeah. is in 35 different countries, Sister Ida. Yes, and that it's it's minerals and uh, different things. But what I'm really trying to say is, until we really find out what companies are where and what they're doing, like you're trying to tell us, it's like um, if you're in one country, you don't know that it's going on, the same thing is going on in a different country. Yeah, that one, that red one. Um, so I think I think that... Uh, we need to start actually documenting like you've started doing and what they're doing. And also, I think my other comment would be that um, I posted, I think probably yesterday or this morning or something about um, all the black towns in America that have disappeared or they put them underwater. Or they, I think that they can't really do that in Africa if we... If, if we sort of claim it as our own, because it is ours, and and kick them out, they can't be doing the same sort of things that they've done in America, in Africa, if if we can stand um, united. united, yes. So, um, I don't know, that, that would be my extra bit, because um, what, I'm glad you're posting it to us, because... Um, we see and we hear you, but there's so much information there that um, we're not necessary. We can't necessarily take it in in two hours. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, th thank you, Sister Ida, for that. Of course, uh, I've been I've been having access to this data for some time, and I realized why don't we share it? And that's why I said, why don't you do a review of this? There are a lot of things that we need to know, and sometimes we don't take time to know them. You see, because as I've said. If people are controlling 371,000 kilometers square of our land, and you are silent here, look at all these companies, look at them all over, from almost every part of Africa. This Talo Oil Company that is in Uganda is in Kenya. And you realize that in Kenya, they are controlling 600 million barrels of oil. And Kenya still import oil. They are having a right to actually, to actually exploit that 600 million barrels of oil. How much is that? In Kenya recently, there was a scandal of 100,000 barrels of oil that was costing 17 billion Kenya shillings. 100,000. Imagine 600 million. How much can that be for their country? And I think these are very important things that we need to know. And the fact that we don't know them shows either some form of intellectual laziness or some part of us not being sensitive enough to the data of Africa. Because if you're not able to dig deeper, as you are learning in conscience in class, if you are not able to go deeper into not perception, into a perception, dig deeper, then you cannot be able actually to reveal what is necessary steps for us. Uh, before I close in the next uh, seven minutes, allow me to give maybe space for any one person who might want to speak something. Then I'll be giving my final and closing remark. Anybody who is feeling like they are closed out to this contribution, can they feel free maybe to share something? I see Cipri and Nisia. Maybe for the first time joining us, Okenga from Uganda is here. Sister Uzuamaka is here. Sister Shola is here. Raspala from uh, South Africa is here. Kelly, if you have anything that you find that you can contribute here in regards to this data, just have a minute or two to share it before we close you out. Obukang Ramtela is also here. Ram, Ramarcela. So anybody, do you have anything to share to say or to share before I bring this to towards the Conclusion. Uh, 
Okay, um, if I'm to come in, all I can say is that the ball is in our courts. Um, let's keep on reflecting, reviewing, and um, learning from the past mistakes. I always um, quote and say I'm humbled by the writings of Ben Amin in his book, God, the Black Man and Truth. Um, he wrote a chapter there that says the power to defy and he outlined clearly why we are forever trying but not getting there. So I think we need to spend more time reflecting what went wrong previously, and then um, that can also contribute to informing the our how how we go about. But um, yes, let's keep the fire burning, the flame burning, and um, be determined. Amidst all challenges and hardship, um, we stay motivated that we shall overcome someday. We don't know where and how. We we'll try until we persist until we succeed. I always say that this is, a, this is my motto. I persist until I succeed for no vein of mine is running with failure. So let that be the spirit amongst us. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Ipsi, very much for that. Indeed, until we start, what, start acting, we will not stop talking. So let's keep talking until we start acting. And we must know, as it was said, that the greatest tool in the hand of the oppressor is just our mind, us. So nobody is actually enslaving you. It is you who have enslaved your mind, you see? Because look, how these companies operate in Africa. Look, just the resources, how might they take from Africa? Surely, these millions of money that these companies take from Africa, why should they continue doing this? Why? Do you want to tell me six years since independence we cannot send any of them away? You see what Nigeria is doing under uh, and, uh, and the country like Sierra Leone, that, uh, Burkina Faso. They're telling them go away. And they're packing. It is possible. But you're living with them as if they are, they, they, they are ten commandments from whatever Christian doctrines that are put on us that they must never leave or thou shall never leave our country. It's possible they can't. Only if we decide to do so. Yes, I know leadership has been raised as a serious issue. And we must rethink on that. Because I don't think we can go through the same political system to produce different results with the same political system that has been producing the same results. I don't think it's possible. And that's why, actually, also retaliate what Sister is saying, that we must test backwards. Elections have been done in Africa over thousands, close to millions of elections since independence. Have they ever produced different results? No, very few, very few circumstances, of course. Case study of Magufu is a few circumstances that is standing up, very few. So if a process has been repeated over a thousand times and produced maybe 1% or 2% result, how many times do you have to repeat the same process to produce 100% result? These are things we need to understand, you see? So I, I, am, I, am, I'm, I am actually touched with this, but it is very serious that we must actually go back to understand and dig deeper. Because, for example, if you ask Africans, how many people are aware of this information? Even me, I was not aware that in Kenya, an oil company controlled all that amount of oil in my country. Recently, I was doing a research on, on the, the, the first family of Kenya, the first president's family in Kenya, and I realized those people own land, even after white man left. 555,000 hectares of land in Kenya where animals are just sleeping and grazing. And nobody and many people are actually displaced locally. Will you blame a white man for that? For somebody, a politician in Kenya, to continue controlling the land? So, comrades, yes, this is just a part of research that you're trying now to dig deeper into as a class, as conscious in class, to try to put this data close to our eyes so that you can have access to re-examine them and consciously look unto them and hoping that with that information, you can act. A lot need to be done. Of course, the recommendations that have been suggested by, the, by, 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 this, uh, by these researchers are very paramount and very important that you cannot ignore. If you read what they have suggested here, for example, in their take that they suggest things like the UK government should stop supporting primary 
resource extraction from Africa. Yes, Africa should stop being just raw material center. We must produce finished products. I agree with that. Other issues like we must put pressure to the UK government to stop supporting systems that enables multinational domicile or listed companies to avoid paying taxes in Africa. But that is not even the concern. We should stop our government from giving them tax savings. Kenya is saying they're opening their borders. And they're saying, yes, when you open our borders, foreign companies will come invest. They'll employ our young people. They'll get a job. And then we'll get return. That's bullshit. That's long overdue mentality. So comrades, I, I, as I come to an end, me, I do appreciate your presence. And as a class, CSG class, we actually appreciate your presence. And we will keep talking until we start acting. But as you've said, moving forward to next year, we as a class are open enough to think of how we can set up an African committees. And we will give, of course, our Zoom account for any meetings of those committees virtually, anytime they'll want. And we'll give still account for, even if you have to do public participation, we can still do it virtually. via invitation for members to give opinion. But we now must move to an organized procedure where now we must organize based on topics, not based on our organization, based on topic based. So we must bring committees together of economists to relook really into that, organizations and Pan-African organizations talking about economics, we must bring committees and of people who are looking on the legal and the constitution of Africa. We are going to bring together people who are looking at the religious aspect, people who are looking at education aspect. All organizations that are dealing with that must come together. Take a whole year, even if you want to meet monthly, we'll give space for that in each organization or each committee. Re discuss this for a whole year. At the end of the year, we want you to come up with a Pan-African education curriculum wanted to come up with a procentric continental constitution that can be ratified and that can unite us as a people. It's possible. So this is where we are heading. And without wasting my time, because our time is passed, I'll actually end this session here. And I'll wish you all to have a blessed evening. Don't forget about this next Saturday. Of course, Brother Kwame Goza will be presenting to us on the uh, African rapid transport system as an alternative on how we can connect our continent in terms of transport. Because why don't you have a route from Kenya to Zanzibar? Why don't you have a route directly on road from Kenya to Cairo, to, 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 to Congo, from South Africa to Etawa? It's possible. And you have the resources. If you pull together and contribute together, we can make this. So that is the step you're moving to, and it will be our last class for this year. As we look forward to next year's to have more conversations and discussions. As it has been said, this is a thought and action class. Through thinking, we can engage in appropriate action. So may you all be blessed. Thank you.